Bookstore presents a reading of Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Grey Champion. There was once a time when New England groaned under the actual pressure of heavier wrongs than those threatened ones which brought on the revolution. James the Second, the bigoted successor of Charles the Voluptuous, had annulled the charters of all the colonies and sent a harsh and unprincipled soldier to take away our liberties and endanger our religion. The administration of Sir Edmund Andros lacked scarcely a single characteristic of tyranny, a governor and council holding office from the king and wholly independent of the country, laws made and taxes levied without concurrence of the people, immediate or by their representatives, the rights of private citizens violated and the titles of all landed property declared void, the voice of complaint stifled by restrictions on the press, and finally, disaffection overvowed by the first band of mercenary troops that ever marched on our free soil. For two years, our ancestors were kept in sullen submission by that filial love which had invariably secured their allegiance to the mother country, whether its head chanced to be a parliament, protector, or popish monarch. Till these evil times, however, such allegiance had been merely nominal, and the colonists had ruled themselves, enjoying far more freedom than is even yet the privilege of the native subjects of Great Britain. At length, a rumor reached our shores that the Prince of Orange had ventured on an enterprise, the success of which would be the triumph of civil and religious rights and the salvation of New England. It was but a doubtful whisper. It might be false, or the attempt might fail. And in either case, the man that stirred against King James would lose his head. Still, the intelligence produced a marked effect. The people smiled mysteriously in the streets and threw bold glances at their oppressors. While far and wide there was a subdued and silent agitation, as if the slightest signal would rouse the whole land from its sluggish despondency. Aware of the danger, the rulers resolved to avert it by an imposing display of strength, and perhaps to confirm their despotism by yet harsher measures. One afternoon in April, 1689, Sir Edmund Andros and his favorite counselors, being warm with wine, assembled the redcoats of the governor's guard, and made their appearance in the streets of Boston. The sun was near setting when the march commenced. The roll of the drum at that unquiet crisis seemed to go through the streets less as the martial music of the soldiers than as a muster call to the inhabitants themselves. A multitude by various avenues assembled in King Street, which was destined to be the scene nearly a century afterwards of another encounter between the troops of Britain and a people struggling against her tyranny. Though more than sixty years had elapsed since the pilgrims came, this crowd of their descendants still showed the strong and somber features of their character, perhaps more strikingly in such a stern emergency than on happier occasions. There was the sober guard, the general severity of mien, the gloomy but undismayed expression, the scriptural forms of speech, and the confidence in heaven's blessing on a righteous cause, which would have marked a band of the original Puritans when threatened by some peril of the wilderness. Indeed, it was not yet time for the old spirit to be extinct. Since there were men in the street that day who had worshipped there beneath the trees before a house was reared to the God for whom they had become exiles. Old soldiers of the Parliament were here too, smiling grimly at the thought that their aged arms might strike another blow against the house of Stuart. Here also 
were the veterans of King Philip's War, who had burnt villages and slaughtered young and old with pious fierceness, while the godly souls throughout the land were helping them with prayer. Several ministers were scattered among the crowd, which, unlike all other mobs, regarded them with such reverence as if there were sanctity in their very garments. These holy men exerted their influence to quiet the crowd, but not to disperse them. Meantime, the purpose of the governor in disturbing the peace of the town at a period when the slightest commotion might throw the country into a ferment was almost the universal subject of inquiry and variously explained. Satan will strike his master's stroke presently, cried some, because he knoweth that his time is short. All our godly pastors are to be dragged to prison. We shall see them at Smithfield Fire in King Street. Hereupon, the people of each parish gathered closer round their minister, who looked calmly upwards and assumed a more apostolic dignity as well befitted a candidate for the highest honor of his profession, the crown of martyrdom. It was actually fancied at that period that New England might have a John Rogers of her own to take the place of that worthy in the primer. The Pope of Rome has given orders for a new St. Bartholomew, cried some. We are to be massacred, man and male child. Neither was this rumor wholly discredited, although the wiser class believed the governor's object somewhat less atrocious. His predecessor under the old charter, Bradstreet, a venerable companion of the first settlers, was known to be in town. There was grounds for conjuncturing that Sir Edmund Andros intended at once to strike terror by a parade of military force and to confound the opposite faction by possessing himself of their chief. Stand firm for the old charter governor, shouted the crowd, seizing upon the idea. The good old Governor Bradstreet! While this cry was at the loudest, the people were surprised by the well-known figure of Governor Bradstreet himself, a patriarch of nearly ninety, who appeared on the elevated steps of a door, and with characteristic mildness besought them to submit to the constituted authorities. My children, concluded this venerable person, do nothing rashly. Cry not aloud, but pray for the welfare of New England, and expect patiently what the Lord will do in this matter. The event was soon to be decided. At this time, the roll of the drum had been approaching through Cornhill, louder and deeper, till with reverberations from house to house and the regular tramp of martial footsteps, it burst into the street. double rank of soldiers made their appearance, occupying the whole breadth of the passage with shouldered matchlocks and matches burning so as to present a row of fires in the dusk. Their steady march was like the progress of a machine that would roll irresistibly over everything in its way. Next, moving slowly, with a confused clatter of hooves on the pavement, rode a party of mounted gentlemen, the central figure being Sir Edmund Andros, elderly but erect and soldier-like. Those around him were his favorite counselors and the bitterest foes of New England. At his right hand rode Edward Randolph, our arch-enemy, 
that blasted wrench, as Cotton Mather calls him, who claimed the downfall of our ancient government and was followed with the sensible curse through life and to his grave. On the other side was Boulevant, scattering jests and mockery as he rode along. Dudley came behind with a downcast look, dreading as well he might to meet the indignant gaze of the people who beheld him, their own countrymen by birth, among the oppressors of his native land. The captain of a frigate in the harbor and two or three civil officers under the crown were also there. But the figure which most attracted the public eye and stirred up the deepest feeling was the Episcopal clergyman of King's Chapel, riding haughtily among the magistrates in his priestly vestments, the fitting representative of prelacy and persecution, the union of church and state, and all those abominations which had driven the Puritans to the wilderness." Another guard of soldiers in double rank brought up the rear. The whole scene was a picture of the condition of New England and its moral, the deformity of any government that does not grow out of the nature of things and the character of the people. On one side, the religious multitude, with their sad visages and dark attire, and on the other, the group of despotic rulers, with the high churchmen in the midst, and here and there a crucifix at their bosoms, all magnificently clad, flushed with wine, proud of unjust authority, and scoffing at the universal groan. And the mercenary soldiers, waiting but the word to deluge the street with blood, showed the only means by which obedience could be secured. O oh, Lord of hosts! cried a voice among the crowd. Provide a champion for thy people! The ejaculation was loudly uttered and served as a herald's cry to introduce a remarkable personage. The crowd had rolled back and were now huddled together nearly at the extremity of the street, while the soldiers had advanced no more than a third of its length. The intervening space was empty, a paved solitude between lofty edifices which threw almost a twilight shadow over it. Suddenly, there was seen the figure of an ancient man who seemed to have emerged from among the people and was walking by himself along the center of the street to confront the armed band. He wore the old Puritan dress, a dark cloak, and a steeple-crowned hat, in the fashion of at least fifty years before, with a heavy sword upon his thigh, but a staff in his hand to assist the tremulous gait of age. When at some distance from the multitude, the old man turned slowly round, displaying a face of antique majesty, rendered doubly venerable by the hoary beard that descended on his breast. He made a gesture at once of encouragement and warning, then turned again and resumed his way. Who is this gray patriarch? asked the young man of their sires. Who is this venerable brother? asked the old man among themselves. But none could make reply. The fathers of the people, those of four score years and upwards, were disturbed, deeming it strange that they should forget one of such evident authority, whom they must have known in their early days, the associate of Winthrop and all the old counselors, giving laws and making prayers and leading them against the savage. The elderly men ought to have remembered him too, with locks as gray in their youth as their own were now, and the young, how could he have passed so utterly from their memories, that hoary sight, the relic of long-departed times, whose awful benediction had surely been bestowed on their uncovered heads in childhood? Whence did he come? What is his purpose? Who can this old man be? whispered the wondering crowd. Meanwhile, the venerable stranger, staff in hand, was pursuing his solitary walk along the center of the street. 
as he drew near the advancing soldiers, and as the roll of their drum came full upon his ear, the old man raised himself to a loftier mien, while the decrepitude of age seemed to fall from his shoulders, leaving him in grey but unbroken dignity. Now he marched onward with a warrior's step, keeping time to the military music. Thus the aged form advanced on one side, and the whole parade of soldiers and magistrates on the other, till when scarcely twenty yards remained between, the old man grasped his staff by the middle and held it before him like a leader's truncheon. Stand! cried he. The eye, the face, the attitude of command, the solemn yet warlike peal of that voice, fit either to rule a host in the battlefield or to be raised to God in prayer, were irresistible. At the old man's word and outstretched arm, the roll of the drum was hushed at once, and the advancing line stood still. A tremulous enthusiasm seized upon the multitude. That stately form combining the leader and the saint, so gray, so dimly seen, in such ancient garb, could only belong to some old champion of the righteous cause whom the oppressor's drum had summoned from his grave. They raised a shout of awe and exultation and looked for the deliverance of New England. The governor and the gentlemen of his party, perceiving themselves brought to an unexpected stand, rode hastily forward, as if they would have pressed their snorting and affrighted horses right against the hoary apparition. He, however, blenched not a step, but glancing his severe eye round the group which half encompassed him, at last bent it sternly on Sir Edmund Andros. One would have thought that the dark old man was chief ruler there, and that the governor and council, with the soldiers at their back, representing the whole and authority of the crown, had no alternative but obedience. "'What does this old fellow here?' cried Edward Randolph fiercely. "'On, Sir Edmund, bid the soldiers forward, and give the daughter the same choice that you give all his countrymen, to stand aside or be trampled on. Nay, nay, let us show respect to the good Grand Shire, said Bullivant, laughing. See you not? He is some old round-headed dignitary who hath lain asleep these thirty years and knows nothing of the change of times. Doubtless, doubtless he thinks to put us down with a proclamation in old Knoll's name. "'Are you mad, old man?' demanded Sir Edmund Andros in loud and harsh tones. "'How dare you stay the march of King James's governor?' "'I have stayed the march of a king himself ere now,' replied the grey figure with stern composure. "'I am here, Sir Governor.' because the cry of an oppressed people hath disturbed me in my secret place, and beseeching this favor earnestly of the Lord, it was vouched to me to appear once again on earth in the good cause of his saints. And what speak ye of James? There is no longer a popish tyrant, on the throne of England, and by tomorrow noon his name shall be a byword in this very street where ye would make it a word of terror. Back, thou that wast a governor, back! With this night thy power is ended, tomorrow the prison. Back, lest I foretell the scaffold! The people have been drawing nearer and nearer, and drinking in the words of their champion, who spoke in accents long disfused, like one unaccustomed to converse, except with the dead of many years ago. 
But his voice stirred their souls. They confronted the soldiers, not wholly without arms, and ready to convert the very stones of the street into deadly weapons. Sir Edmund Andros looked at the old man. Then he cast his hard and cruel eye over the multitude and beheld them burning with that lurid wrath so difficult to kindle or to quench. And again he fixed his gaze on the aged form, which stood obscurely in an open space where neither friend nor foe had thrust himself. What were his thoughts? He uttered no word which might discover. But whether the oppressor were overawed by the gray champion's look or perceived his peril in the threatening attitude of the people, it is certain that he gave back and ordered his soldiers to commence a slow and guarded retreat. Before another sunset, the governor and all that rode so proudly with him were prisoners, and long ere it was known that James had abdicated, King William was proclaimed throughout New England. But where was the Grey Champion? Some reported that when the troops had gone from King Street and the people were thronging tumultuously in their rear, Bradstreet, the aged governor, was seen to embrace a form more aged than his own. Others somberly affirmed that while they marveled at the venerable grandeur of his aspect, the old man had faded from their eyes, melting slowly into the hues of twilight till, where he stood, there was an empty space. But all agreed that the hoary shape was gone. The men of that generation watched for his reappearance in sunshine and in twilight, but never saw him more, nor knew when his funeral passed, nor where his gravestone was. And who was the Grey Champion? Perhaps his name might be found in the records of that stern court of justice, which passed a sentence too mighty for the age, but glorious in all after times, for its humbling lesson to the monarch and its high example to the subject. I have heard that whenever the descendants of the Puritans are to show the spirit of their sires, the old man appears again. When eighty years had passed, he walked once more in King Street. Five years later, in the twilight of an April morning, he stood on the green beside the meeting house at Lexington, where now the obelisk of granite with a slab of slate inlaid commemorates the first fallen of the revolution. And when our fathers were toiling at the breastwork on Bunker's Hill, all through that night the old warrior walked his rounds. Long, long may it be ere he comes again. His hour is one of darkness and adversity and peril. But should domestic tyranny oppress us or the invader's step pollute our soil, still may the grey champion come, for he is the type of New England's hereditary spirit, and his shadowy march on the eve of danger must ever be the pledge that New England's sons will vindicate their ancestry. Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Grey Champion Presented by The Barrow Bookstore Located in historic Concord, Massachusetts Home of the Authors Reading and Music by Jamie Lee Thank you for listening. Join us next week for a reading of Louisa May Alcott's 
the children's joke.